Hey everyone, welcome back. This is the second part of the three-part uh, lecture of what came before. And if you recall from the last lecture, we talked about medieval art, uh, and then we started talking about the Renaissance. And one of the things I mentioned with the Renaissance was Neoplatonism, which is the idea of combining stories or ideas from ancient Greece or Rome with biblical stories. And then you come up with a whole new genre of literature and art. And no artist did this better than Michelangelo. So here we have a 4th century statue of the Greek god Hermes. He's in a pose, it's known as contrapposto, where the weight is on one leg and then the opposite arm is tense. And if you can see the missing arm, that would be relaxed, just like the left leg that it is opposite of. The body has an S shape, which implies restrained motion, and the proportions are formulaic and often seen as perfect. The body is eight heads high and it employs the golden mean over and over again. And this Hermes statue is basically what people mean when they say classical Greek art. This falls right into it. And then about a thousand years later, you have Michelangelo and his David, and he employs the same pose. There's that same restrained motion, but this time, instead of it being a Greek god, it's uh, David, the guy who fights Goliath. And this is right before he, he flings his rock. The work is nicknamed the giant because it's huge, but you know, David was the small one in the story. And then this became a um, symbol for the strength of Florence. We're gonna talk more about this specific sculpture in the next lecture. A major innovation in during the Renaissance was the use of linear perspective. And this is before the Renaissance, artists understood, you know, foreground and background, but now it became formulaic. They created a vanishing point where all the lines converge. And by doing this, it creates a more realistic painting. It becomes this idea of a window to the world as opposed to just a, a thing that we're looking at to worship or venerate. Incidentally, this Painting is also a kind of a who's who of the Renaissance. So we're going to take a closer look at the major figures in this story and who they are represented by. The first kind of big name in this painting, called the School of Athens, by the way, is Bramante, and he's shown as Euclid, who's the father of geometry. And he's the first architect of St. Peter's Cathedral, which we'll talk about next time because it's a really important Baroque work of architecture. Next we have Raphael, and he's painting himself as Apelles, who is the greatest of the Greek painters. He was responsible for a painting of Alexander the Great. He painted this, this is his school of Athens, and he's doing this classic thing that a lot of artists do, which is if they are the artist and they put themselves in the painting, then they'll, ha they'll be looking at you. And it's like, I see you looking at my artwork. We're gonna see this again and again. And then it becomes a fun game where if you're at a museum and you're looking at a work of art and you see a person looking at you, you can kind of guess that that might be the actual artist that painted it. Raphael is followed up by Michelangelo, who we've already looked at. He's shown as Heraclitus, who was a philosopher who created this philosophy about how the only thing constant was change and emphasize the potential in everything. And this is perfect for Michelangelo because he was known to look at a hunk of marble and think about how he could free figures from it so he could see the potential of a, a giant chunk of marble and he, he could see sort of what figures were in there and it was his job to free them from it. The last one is Leonardo and he is uh, shown as Plato who was the father of Western philosophy. And, and, you know, he's a genius, and everybody knew it at the time. So Leonardo provided the basis for the scientific method, which is this idea of unbiased observation. I want you to also pay attention to that arm pose, by the way, because we'll see it again and again. In fact, in this slide, you see Leonardo da Vinci, who's painted St. John the Baptist in 1508, and he's pointing up to God, like saying, you know, God is up there. And then Raphael paints... Leonardo as Plato, and he's pointing up not because of God, but he's in the middle of having an argument with Aristotle, who he's standing next to him, and Plato is pointing up and saying there's like a higher, truer reality out there. And Aristotle is actually pointing at the ground, and he's saying this is the only reality. And then the last image in this slide is a painting by David, who we will see later on in the semester, and this is a his painting of the death of Socrates. And 
he has Socrates pointing up as an homage to Leonardo and Raphael before him and saying, look, I, I can be included with the greats. I am just as important as these two painters. And we'll talk about this in detail later as well. Leonardo da Vinci uh, gave us atmospheric perspective, which is by observing things, he noticed that uh, if you look at something far away, it was obscured by a haze or a smokiness. And he called this haziness sfumato, which is Italian for smoky. The question is, did he know that it was caused by an abundance of water molecules in the air? Probably not, but by adding this smokiness to these images, what he's doing is he's, he's creating a better rendition of reality. And this also reflects that idea of the scientific process, right? The scientific method of just look at something and be true to what you see. And this is a theme that we're going to see a lot in this class as well, this painting using empiricism. So now the question is, why do we know who all these guys are when, you know, from the last lecture we were talking about medieval art, we don't know who anybody is? How come all of these painters and sculptors and architects became so famous. The answer, of course, comes down to money and power. It was no longer enough to be mightier militarily than your neighbor or your enemy. Now you had to have the most beautiful castle or palazzo or chateau. And in that palazzo, it had to be adorned with the most amazing art. And interestingly, this is where the idea of art schools came from, because these patrons, Lorenzo de' Medici or Cesare Borgia or Francois Premier, they would find talented artists and then they would hold on to them and train them. And then you have this deep bench of amazing artists that are working for you. And the inevitable result is art schools or art academies or training that results in even better artists in the future. And these patrons would entice artists to come and work for them. So not only did they find young talent, but they would try to poach older, more established talent. In fact, Leonardo da Vinci ended up in France after a lifetime of Italy. He was invited by uh, Francois I. And that's why the Mona Lisa is in Paris and not in Rome, because Leonardo went to France at the end of his life. So moving on to the last style that occurred before the Baroque, um, it was mannerism. Mannerist artists followed the Renaissance artists, and Renaissance artists were known as, as creating, you know, a perfect representation of the natural world. And so these artists, these young guys that wanted to separate themselves from the older crowd now had to figure out how to rebel or how to do something different. They had to go one step further, and, and what they did was they broke the rules that all those Renaissance artists had developed and perfected. And how did they do that? They created really complex compositions instead of the simple ones. They used really weird colors like pinks and violets and greens, and the figures were disproportionate. No longer were the classical idealized images. There was small heads and long bodies. Sculptures were unbalanced. Paintings were unbalanced. You would see too many things on one side and not enough things on another. The mannerism lasted for maybe like 60, 70 years from around the middle, early middle of the 1500s to around 1600. And it leads us directly into the Baroque because mannerists had this flair for drama that you see in the Baroque for sure. Here's a, a couple of examples of breaking the rules. On the left, we see a sculpture by John Bologna, and he created this tall, twisting thing that you, you couldn't just take in in one look like you could with Michelangelo's David. You had to walk around. You had to physically sort of make your way around it to understand the whole story. And no longer is there contrapposto in the classical pose of restrained motion. I mean, this is twisting motion. This is a man stepping on another man while abducting a woman. Even the marble that John Bologna used, this giant chunk of marble that he used, it's flawed. It has this big green stripe in it. It's hard to see in this picture, but instead of picking the perfect piece of white marble like we saw in Michelangelo's David, the marble itself has a flaw, and that's an interesting move to to go beyond what the Renaissance artists did before. In the painting by Parmigianino, there's a lot of weirdness happening. There's all these elongated figures. This is really unbalanced. There's all kinds of angels and 
other people kind of squished into one small area on the side and the body of the Madonna is huge and and then in the corner on the right there's this tiny man and who is that guy and is he tiny or is he far away the artist was supposed to include Saint Jerome in here and that was his solution to paint this tiny far away man and then behind the man with those columns it's hard to understand like where the top is and where the bottom is and is it a row of columns or is it just one column and even the woman that's holding that giant baby she might actually be suffering from some sort of syndrome it's called marfan syndrome in which you're extremely tall and thin and you have elongated extremities and you often have scoliosis so was that woman really weird looking or did parmigianino paint her in this sort of elongated manner also in the corner next to saint jerome there's just like a foot there's no, nobody attached to a foot there's a disembodied foot in this painting so these are prime examples of breaking all the rules and making us question what we're looking at and making us spend time with this painting and all of that comes to play in uh, Baroque art. What I find fascinating, and we'll see this again and again in art, is that just as the, the high Renaissance, like Michelangelo and Leonardo and Raphael, mirrored the values of classical Greek art, of balance and order and control over emotion, mannerism mirrored the values of Hellenistic art, which was the period that followed the classical period in Greece. And you can see this. There's John Bologna's Hercules and Nessus, and look at the bending backwards of that centaur. And then you have Lau Cohen and his sons done during the Hellenistic period of Greece. And there's all, I mean, if you compare it to a classical Greek sculpture, it's breaking all the rules. And there's tiny men boys in there, and they're all fighting a sea serpent. And there's twisting and there's agony and there's emotion and then there's complexity and there's chaos. And so what's interesting is that the Renaissance was followed by mannerism and the classical period of Greece was followed by the Hellenistic period. And they both, these trends sort of show up in both times about a thousand years apart. We're going to end this lecture with a little bit more weirdness. On the left you'll see a painting by El Greco and he also paints these elongated figures with diaphanous material and these strange clouds and he was Greek but he lived in Spain and that's how he got his name El Greco and his colors were off and strange and a lot of modern artists look to El Greco so when we look at Cezanne later we'll see almost these same poses and then there's Archimboldo who made tons of paintings that were like seasonal produce and they weren't supposed to be portraits of anyone they were they were just supposed to represent the bounty. And so there's spring and summer and fall. And, and then in those paintings, there's different fruits and flowers. And it's just weird. And it's great. Okay, so that's it for the art that preceded the Baroque period. Part three will be all about the history that influenced what they painted and why.